Welcome to the Grow Your Law Firm podcast, brought to you by Pilma. This podcast helps lead lawyers to more growth, profit, and freedom. Here is your legal marketing expert and host, Ken Hardison. Well, hello, everyone. This is Ken Hardison, and welcome to another episode of Grow Your Law Firm. And today we got a big treat. We got Darren Wirtz, who is a certified financial planner who really specializes on helping lawyers to save money and manage their assets and plan for retirement. You know, we can't do this for the rest of our life. So, uh, and I know more of you want to get out earlier, the earlier you can, the better you can. So, uh, Darren, thank you for being here today. And, uh, he also has his own podcast, The Lawyer Millionaire, and he's written uh, a seller, a bestseller called The Lawyer Millionaire, and it's uh, I think you can get it at ABA. Can you get it on Amazon too? Yeah. First of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, yeah, you can get it from the ABA. That's probably the best place to get it. Uh, there are some independent sellers that have got it on Amazon, but uh, last time I checked, it was sold out there. So the best place is the ABA for now. Okay, good deal. Tell us your story. How'd you get in this business <laughs> and how'd you pick lawyers of all the people in the world to try to help? Right. Well, we could do a whole podcast just on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my background is in education, actually. I got my start as a teacher and uh, did that for about five years and then decided to join the family business as a financial advisor. And uh, my dad, you know, his business, Words Financial Services is the name of the business. Uh, for many, many years, it was kind of a general practice, so kind of focused on anybody, not any real particular direction. Uh, and then I you know, launched my own office down here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, initially, I was you know, same way, you know, anybody who wants a financial advisor, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to work with you. Uh, but then I quickly kind of started to learn more about marketing and, you know, trying to build a, a more successful business and trying to stand out from the pack. You know, there are a ton of financial advisors out there. Yes. Uh, and so I knew that it was important to have a particular niche that you were focused on. And the way my business developed, I did a lot of networking, you know, a lot of involvement with the Chamber of Commerce and different things like that. And I met a lot of attorneys in the process. And several of those attorneys became my clients. And working with those attorneys, I started to learn more about the unique challenges that attorneys face, uh, specifically law firm owners. And it really started to intrigue me. Uh, and I, I thought it would be really neat to build a practice focused on serving the unique needs that attorneys and law firm owners have. And to be honest, I really didn't see many financial advisors doing that. Uh, you know, you see a lot of advisors who focus on business owners, maybe even doctors and things like that. But I kind of saw, you know, a, a big need there for somebody to, you know, have that particular focus and uh, really learn and know the unique things that um, unique challenges that attorneys have. Well, I can tell you that you are uh, something that our listeners and viewers should pay attention to is. That I can tell you, I just met you five minutes ago, but you're you're a hell of a smart marketer because you've done two things that I preach is that you need to have a book, set you apart, you know, stand you out and to use it as a differentiator. And then the other deal is that there, I've always said there's riches and niches and mm. you follow that because yeah. you're going to lawyers. Absolutely. Uh, like the PI lawyers can even go to just PI, or if you really want a niche, you can go into traumatic brain injuries or whatever, but that's another day. Mm -hmm. But also the podcast, you're not only doing one, you're on mine. And so, yeah. And what I'm finding is, uh, Darren, is that the days of the webinars are gone. Mm. People love podcasts and they're going to those. I mean, because yeah. it's, it's the uh, immediate gratification, do it when I want to do it whatever. So I think you're, you're smart in that way. If well, thank else. you. So tell me the biggest money mistakes attorneys make, because you, you've been doing this for <laughs> several years now. Tell me what you're seeing the biggest mistakes that the lawyers make. Absolutely. You know, there are several that I see pretty commonly. Um, and there's a whole chapter on this in the book, of course. But yeah, I think the biggest thing that I see right off the bat is just not having a plan. And that may not be very attorney specific, but 
you know, not having a written financial plan, not really having a direction, you know, and that's easy to do, especially for attorneys, because you're so busy. And especially if you're a law firm owner, you're busy running your business, just trying to make it successful, you know, and turn a profit. You don't have time to sit down and do financial planning. <laughs> um, but that's where you get into trouble. Because, you know, the truth is, I talk about this over and over is your biggest tool is time. And the earlier you can get started, the earlier you can, you know, figure out what direction you're going in and make sure that you're headed in the right direction, the better, because it's a lot harder to play catch up later in life. Yeah. So if you can get started early, and that's the, another big thing, getting started, not getting started early enough. And this is so easy to do for attorneys, especially nowadays, because we've got, you know, the cost of law school is just going up and up and up. And attorneys are graduating with hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt. And so it's so easy to put off savings. It's so easy to put off investing. And that's such a big mistake, I believe. You know, even if you're trying to, I think you, it's important to do both. You know, even if you have a lot that you have to put towards your student loans, I think it's so critical to get started putting money away. Try to get that employer match in your 401k if you can, you know, because that you're not going to be able to make up that time later in life. And that you need that compounding growth over time. Yeah. Yeah. Because what the rule of 78, I don't know. There's some rule that says 72. Yeah. The rule of 72. <laughs> 72. Okay. I was off by six points, <laughs> but, but yeah, the time value of money, I guess is what you're saying because it can just, yeah. uh, I was watching this video the other day and the guy said, if you offered a 3 million or one penny double every day for 30 days, which would you take? And he laid it out and you would end up with like 30 million yeah. Versus 3 million because of the, that of it doubling every day, you know, you say, well, just a penny, oh, yeah. how can that go? It just blew my mind. It got me thinking, you know? Yeah. I know exactly what, what you're talking about. And I've, I've seen that and it, it really is mind blowing. Uh, yeah. and, and that's one of the things we show is, you know, if you, it seems a million dollars, right. That seems like such a huge mark to hit, especially if you're just coming out of law school, but if you just start putting away uh, you know, it doesn't have to be very much $500 a month, $1,000 a month, you will reach that mark, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and it's incredible. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the deal. I mean, do you have a percentage or do you, each, each person, you got to look at them individually, what their debt situation is, I guess, or, you know, responsibilities are, but you got like a benchmark, like you should put at least 10 or 20% of your income in to, you mm. know, save uh, you know, in retirement or savings or whatever? Yeah, it really varies um, based on, you know, how much time you have and what your goals are, you know. Uh, so it, it's tough to kind of put a, a number on it. You know, there are some generic guidelines out there. I would say at least 10%, you know, maybe aiming towards closer to 20 uh, would be a kind of a good, you know, generic guideline. But yeah, yeah it really is going to depend. If you're starting early, you know, then it can be less. And that's the truth, you know, and if you get started later, then it needs to be more because you're having to play catch up. Um, and everybody's goal, of course, is different. You know, some people want to retire early. You know, there's the whole fire movement, financially independent, retire early, where people are, you know, trying to squirrel away maybe 30, 40, maybe even 50% of their income to try to retire by like 50. So a lot of it really depends on what your unique circumstances are and you know when exactly you're trying to retire and that sort of thing you know darren i've tried to retire twice it's all two law firms so i had the money to do it okay <laughs> i just got so bored man and i bet you probably seen i'm one of these guys that i go i can't play but so much golf and fish so much you know and read so many books <laughs> and i just i don't get any uh i don't know my people ask me when you're going to retire and i said as long as i'm physically and mentally able, I don't know that I'll ever retire. I, I might want to just slow down and do what I want to do when I want to do it. Exactly. So that's you really, know? yeah, that's really it. You know, we, we call that financial freedom or financial independence. And it's being able to work on your own terms. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I could retire if I want to, you know, I'm just here. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And some people, you know, especially attorneys, because your identity is tied up in what you do. You're, you are an attorney, you know, it kind of feels like, yeah. If I retire, I'm giving up who I am. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, yeah, and it, it was hard for me. I mean, I had to find another avenue. I mean, you know, 
I started Pilma uh, 13 okay. years ago. And really, it was not a plan. It just kind of happened because everybody kept calling me asking for advice because I built <laughs> two law firms so fast and they wanted to know what the secret was. Well, they want no big secret, a lot of hard work and a lot of testing and trying stuff and taking calculated risk, which brings me to this. Yeah. We were talking about this before we went on the air, and I found that personal injury lawyers are a lot, their, their risk tolerance is a lot higher than like, say, maybe a domestic attorney or, or a state planning, yeah. you know, a more transactional lawyer, corporate <laughs> lawyer. Have you found that to be the same? Yeah, it definitely can be that way for sure. You know, a lot of people are not used to that, you know, kind of the, the cycle of uh, the boom and bust cycle. You know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that's a very challenging uh, part of being an attorney. And, and we talk about that in the book is managing that cash flow cycle, yeah. because that can really set you up for disaster if you don't manage it well. And it's not just, you know, personal injury attorneys are probably the prime example of, you know, that uh, feast or famine, you know, kind of thing, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. You have, to, you have to put all the money up front to get the cases yeah. in, work the cases, spend the money on help, you know, employees, and you're taking a risk because sometimes you don't always win. You try, you know, you try to want to win, you know, 98% of them, but the deal is. Right. And you might spend out of your pocket $100,000 on experts and then lose the case. I mean. Right. Uh, and then you've got, you know, you're completely tax inefficient because your income is getting bunched into these, you know, one, these particular instances, and maybe you have a whole bunch of income in one particular year, and then you're being skyrocketed up into a higher tax bracket. And then it's very difficult psychologically. So you have all this money come in and you think, oh, you know, this is great. I can live it up, you know? <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. if you're not careful, then you, you're into the famine cycle and it is kind of a slow season. And then you're like, oh, oh no, I didn't put enough away. So yeah. that is something that we help people with is to try to manage that more effectively. And it's a big challenge. Yeah, because I, I remember the first year that I had to pay seven figures income tax. <laughs> I got physically sick. I'm not lying. I, I, yeah. I got physically sick because I couldn't understand it. You know, right. I mean, it, right. it just, how can I have to pay? And the deal is nobody felt sorry for me. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course not. Right. That, you know, <laughs> so I really couldn't complain about it. Other yeah. than uh, to my immediate family, but I mean, it really was. And, you know, after that, I had several bigger cases that I hit that I uh, put the money. I, I didn't take the fee. I put it in defer. I deferred it into yeah. like, annuities and different things kind of mm -hmm. get when I turn, start drawing it when I turn 65 or something like that, which I'm 65 now. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and I did that 20 years ago. And that, mm -hmm. that's another thing that can really work out good for you, too. Uh, for sure. Yeah. So what is your investment? I mean, is it, do you have like a formula or like, cause like right now, you know, stock markets all over the place, you know, I heard it, <laughs> uh, and then I heard everybody was taking their profits yesterday, yesterday and then Monday was great. And, and my financial advisor, you know, being the, the entrepreneur and the gambler and all that stuff, I kind of want to go out and pick individual stocks, you know, and maybe even some crypto or something. Uh, but that's probably not the smartest thing to do. My, my, my advisor told me to just take these indexes, you know, and put a portion of it in this and a portion of it in this index and, yeah. you know, and then some of it in bonds and some of it in this and just be consistent. It looks right. like you were saying, put something in every month. I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I think now's the time to put the money in the stock market because it's low, but I mean, how, what do oh, I Oh man. What yeah, do I know so that? <laughs> I think you're right, you know, uh, and, and that is really, you, you hit it, hit the nail on the head there because uh, speculation, it's okay to speculate, you know, with a little bit. And yeah. some people enjoy that. Some of my clients do that. I allow them to do that with a little portion of their portfolio. I would say most of the clients that I'm working with, they're of the type who they just want me to do it for them. You know, they don't want to worry about it. They don't want to learn about it and that kind of thing. And so that's fine. But you know, imagine, you know, last year, the stock market was hitting all time highs, you know, in December, you know, and, and the, people were euphoric, you know, they were making all kinds of money. It was great. People were feeling great. 
Well, imagine I came to you in December and I said, Ken, I'm going to give you the opportunity to buy the S&P 500 right now for a 25% discount. You would have been all over it. Right. <laughs> Well, that's what we have right now. You know what I mean? The, the stock market is at a 25% discount and it will come back, you know? And so it's important for us to be careful of our psychology because when the market's down, that's when we want to stop investing. We want to curtail yeah. our investing. I mean, really, this is, that's when we should be ramping it up, you know? Yeah. So I, I agree with you on that. You know, it's like uh, some of our lawyers in Pilma, you know, when the pandemic hit, a lot of the lawyers were pulling back their marketing, but I had some of them that were doubling up because yeah, they wanted to try to capture, you could get twice as many commercials on TV, twice as many billboards for the same money because the other people were pulling out. They went in because they wanted to try to grab a bigger part of the market. Absolutely. Yes. You know? Yeah. And that's, that is something I talk about briefly in the book. There's a chapter on surviving a recession as part of as a law firm owner, you know, and if we're looking back at 08, you know, 2008, the firms that survived were the firms that did exactly that, you know, they didn't step back, they didn't pull back. In fact, they ramped up and tried to gain market share during yeah. that kind of a, an environment. And that is really what can help you get through those time periods. Yeah, it's kind of like a contrarian method, but but I think right. it's, you know, uh, you're too young, probably ever even know about this movie. It's called The Wonderful Life. Uh, I know that movie. Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy, Stewart, with Jimmy Stewart. I watch it every Christmas. Right. And, the, and Potter's the banker. When everybody there's a run on the bank, he's buying everything up. That's and Jimmy it. Says, you know these people. He says, "Why do you think he's buying it? Don't sell. Don't sell. You know, mm -hmm. he's the smart guy. He's holding his head. You know, he's being the smart guy, and he was. Right. But uh, so tell me about. And I know age has got a lot to do with it. I know that you got to probably get a little bit more conservative the older you get because you can't got enough time to make it back if you do have a big loss. But, yeah. You know, I would think that. But tell me about real estate because I've always dabbled in real estate my whole life, but yeah. never really crushed it like some of my friends. I mean, I got some film members that are crushing it with like right. multifamily housing and things like that. And mm -hmm. I just, uh, you know, I've just I've dabbled in it, but nothing. What do you think about that? The kind of, I guess you say. You know, it's funny you mentioned this because I see this a lot. You know, it, it's very interesting that it's a, a lot of attorneys are interested in real estate investing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have a, a negative opinion about it. I think it's great from a standpoint of maybe developing a, a diversified stream of income, you know, and a different set of income. And that can be very helpful for managing that cash flow cycle that we were talking about, you know, right. navigating the ups and downs of the business cycle. If you have another stream of income that can supplement your overall income when, you know, the market's down or you're having a slow period in business, that's great. I like that. Now, I do talk about real estate investing. Um, you know, I'm a stock market guy and, and my bias is for the stock market. Right, right, <laughs> I'm right. just going to admit that up front. You know, you know, part of the problem, I wouldn't say the problem, I'd say the challenge, part of the challenge with real estate investing is that it is very specific. So, you know, it's location, location, location. You know, as you said before, some people are going to hit it big, they're going to hit it out of the park. And that's kind of uh, the same thing with stocks. You know, individual stocks have a lot of risk, but they also have a lot of potential return. Same thing as with uh, with real estate investing. When you're you know doing direct real estate investing, you have a lot more risk because you're focused on one particular property, and you have all the risks that are associated with that particular property. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of challenges that are there. Now, if you're if you're smart about it and you know the market, you know maybe it can pay off very well, um, and it can be great as maybe an alternative stream of income. But if we look generally, if we look broadly at the real estate market as a whole, and we compare its long-term performance versus the stock market, the stock market, you know, over the long term has tended to outperform. So now that's general, you know, we're taking the, the entire real estate market into right. consideration. Obviously, there are going to be particular properties that may do better, you know, depending on what, where the trends are. And if you can navigate those, you know, hats off to you. And then I would say, you know, 
real estate investing is a great idea, but don't let it take away from what you should be putting into your investments, into your portfolio, into your 401k. Uh, don't let it detract from that because you still need that. And that's very critical. So let me ask you this, because I, like I said, I've played with this stuff and you can tell our listeners what I'm talking about because you'll explain a lot better than I will, I'm sure. Uh, I always look at properties like rental properties when I'm buying, I'm looking at the cap cap rate. You know, what's the capitalization? What's the return based on a certain formula of how much rent is taken in and what's the cost and the vacancy rate and all that stuff. Have you got mm -hmm. a, you got like, you give advice on like, Hey, Mr. Lawyer, you know, if it ain't got at least a 6% cap rate, you don't need to be playing with this or, mm -hmm. it got, or do you want it to have an 8% or whatever? Cause I've seen well, people sell them at 3% and I just can't get excited about 3%. I'm sorry. Yeah. Me neither. Especially if we're thinking about inflation, being around 8%, you know, uh, then we're definitely going to need something that's going to yield over eight, you know, in this kind of an environment uh, right. to just to outpace inflation. Now, if inflation comes back down, you know, that could be, that could be very helpful. Stocks tend to keep pace very well with inflation. The long-term average rate of return for the stock market is somewhere around nine to 10%, you know, and if you're using maybe a, a more aggressive strategy, you might be in the neighborhood of double digits, you know, 10 to 12% or maybe even more. So I would compare it with that. Now, you know, it's not necessarily all about that number. It needs to be competitive, but having a, a, some property that you're invested in can be a great diversifier. So from that aspect, you know, it could be great, but yeah, I would agree with you. 3% would not, <laughs> would definitely not interest yeah. me at all. Yeah. You know, it's funny, but I grew up really poor and my dad, you know, he was poor. He was a, a fourth grade education and, uh, you know, he, he bought a couple of rental houses and he, I asked him, I said, why are you doing this? He said, so that's the only way I can save money. <laughs> he said, cause I'm paying <laughs> the mortgage off. Somebody else helping me paying it off. And then when I get paid off, you know, I've got the income and I've got the, the assets here. If I need to liquefy, yeah. I, can, I can do it. And he said, I've never been able to save money because I've never, you know, I just didn't make enough to really yeah. do it, you know? And so, so your, your dad was practicing something called forced savings. And that's actually a very good strategy. And, and I, I tell people this with, you know, their investments, treat it like a bill, you know, treat it like it's something that you have to pay, just like your electric bill, or your mortgage, you know, and that way you force yourself to do it. Yeah. 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 So I want to talk about tax uh, minimization for attorneys. Sure. Uh, like you just pick maybe three or four of them that, you know, like Roth, stealth, charitable, whatever, just whatever you think are like the top three or four things lawyers should be thinking about. Okay. Yeah, first would be, uh, you know, the 401k itself. And one of the things that gets me really excited about attorneys and law firm owners is when, you know, a law firm owner, maybe a solo attorney can take advantage of some really cool things with their 401k. So if you're a solo attorney, you can do a solo 401k and you can really you can really squirrel some money away in ways that you might not otherwise be able to do. Uh, you know, one of the things that's very limiting and one of the things we try to discover and try to figure out for attorneys is, you know, the balance between trying to save money on taxes now versus how do we make sure our tax efficiency is good over the long term? Yeah. You know, if you're putting all your money into the pre-tax side of things, you know, you're going to save a lot of money on taxes now when you get to retirement, you're going to, you know, everything you pull out is going to be taxable. And that may not be the most tax efficient way to go about things. I'm really big on the Roth. You know, I think that that's really an important piece of the pie. It doesn't necessarily have to be the whole piece of the pie, but I think it's, it's critical from a standpoint can you, of, mm -hmm. can you explain what that is? Absolutely. So pre-tax means that you are getting a tax deduction today. If you put $10,000 into your 401k pre-tax, you reduce your income by $10,000 today. Right. Uh, however, when you get to 59 and a half, anything you pull out, the original 10,000 plus any of its earnings is taxable. The Roth, on the other hand, you know, you put $10,000 in on the Roth basis, you don't get a tax deduction today. But when you get to retirement, the 10,000 plus all the earnings is tax free. 
Um, and so you have, you know, all this money you've earned on that 10,000 or however much it is, all of your earnings becomes tax-free. And that's a really nice thing. And, and I think it's also good from the standpoint of mitigating tax risk. You know, we don't know what tax laws are going to be like in the future. Uh, maybe taxes will be higher. Maybe they'll be lower. We don't know. But, you know, if, if you have a bunch of money on the Roth side, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> is there a maximum amount you can put in a Roth? So this is where the 401k becomes really helpful because, you know, you have a Roth IRA that you can use and the maximum there is 6,000 a year or 7,000 if you're over 50, you have an income limit. And a lot of attorneys hit that income limit and they are priced out of being able to put money into a Roth IRA. With the 401k, there's no income limit. Um, and so I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but with the 401k, you have an employee amount and you have an employer amount that can be put in there. And the employee amount, I think is uh, somewhere around 21,000. And that amount can be either pre-tax or it can be Roth. So you have, you know, 20 grand or so that you can put away straight into Roth and you don't have to worry about whether you meet the qualifications or not, you know, as long as you have the income, you know, then, you know, there's uh, above and beyond that, you can put up to about 50,000. Um, I think it might be 60,000 now. Uh, into that 401k with employer money. And that employer money can be pre-tax, or you can actually make an employee, employee contribution that's after tax. And then you can flip that after tax over to the Roth side. So essentially, if you're doing it the right way, you can put about 60 grand a year into Roth using your 401k. And we call that the mega backdoor Roth strategy. Okay. So that's kind of a neat one. There are some other ca you know, cool things that you can do. Um, one I talk about is called the Stealth IRA. Uh, not a lot of people know about this, so that's why I call it the Stealth IRA. And it's basically using your HSA, uh, which is your health savings account. So yeah. a lot of yeah. attorneys have a high deductible um, uh, health insurance plan because you're getting your own insurance on your own and you probably don't want to pay a lot for it. So naturally, that's typically what happens. And so with a high deductible uh, health insurance plan, you can use a health savings account. And the cool thing about a health savings account is you get kind of a double tax advantage. Money you put in is tax deductible, and then you can use it to pay your health expenses tax-free. You know, so you put money in and you have these earnings, you basically can use this money to get a tax deduction and then pay health expenses tax-free, which is really a neat thing. Now, one of the awesome things about the HSA is you don't have to use it right away. You can let it sit there and grow. So then when you get to 65, you can take distributions for anything. It doesn't have to be health related. And um, you, know, you can basically treat it like an IRA. Now, if it's not health related, you do have to pay income tax, but you're not going to be penalized. So basically it becomes an extra bucket pre-tax bucket that you can use uh, to try to maximize money that you're putting uh, towards retirement. Yeah. You know, Darren, I, I've had that and they give you a little card, like a debit card and you just yeah. go to your drugstore, your doctor and pay your deductible. I love it. You know, Absolutely. It's, like, it's pretty neat really, you know, and this. Yeah. Yeah. Like and it. historically a lot of those HSAs were just kind of like savings accounts. Uh, but now a lot of them offer you the opportunity to invest the funds, like in the S&P 500 and different things like that. And so you can actually get some really good growth over the long term. And that's a really exciting feature. Uh, one of the last things I'll say, uh, the third thing I'll add for, for tax uh, savings, and this is above and beyond the 401k. If you're really, if your law firm is really killing it and you really need some tax deductions, <laughs> Uh, you can pair a 401k with what's called a cash balance plan. A uh, cash balance plan is basically a pension plan. It's a type of pension plan. And, you know, it has a certain amount that you have to put into it to try, you know, that's calculated based on your income and your age. Uh, and so you can really, you know, it, you can squirrel away $100,000 or more a year on a pre-tax basis using a cash balance plan. And the, you, know, you can have both. You can have the 401k and the cash balance plan uh, at the same time. And you can utilize both if you want to. Like that, yeah. 
So here's another question. You know, as I get older, I start thinking about this. How much money do you need to retire? <laughs> That's a great question. And it's the, it really is the golden question. The book is called The Lawyer Millionaire. Uh, for many people, that's the goal. Uh, but actually, really, the goal is never really a specific dollar amount. The goal is how much do I specifically need, me personally, you know, to reach my own uh, retirement, my own financial independence. For everybody, it's different. You know, I'll often joke with clients, you know, I'm pretty young. I could retire today, but, you know, I would only be able to spend, you know, I'd have to live in a tent somewhere, you know? Right. <laughs> so really, it's a function of what kind of a lifestyle do you envision for yourself? And when do you want that to happen? You know, do you want to retire at 50 and, you know, live modestly? Do you want to retire at 65 and have a vacation home and a boat and, you know, all kinds of other things? So really, that's the biggest thing is sitting down with clients and figuring out, okay, what are your goals? You know, what do you envision life to look like for yourself and where are you trying to get to? Yeah, that is the big one because I, you know, I've been reading on this stuff as I get older and they say, uh, maybe you won't spend as much, maybe you'll spend more, you know, but you did kind of like right. what you're spending now. And, you know, and then there's always a deal about downsizing. You know, there's a simple formula of the 4% rule you may be familiar with. Um, so you take your current spending divided by 4%. And that's kind of a guideline for what should last for about 30 years. You know, so for instance, you know, if you need $100,000 to a year after taxes, you know, you're going to need maybe 4 million. Now that may be a high estimate, but, you know, there's... Um, it really depends on what your particular goals are. Maybe I did that. <laughs> 100,000 divided by 4%. That'd be 2.5 million. <laughs> that was, yeah. I, uh, not times, divided by 4%. You know, so that's one way to kind of gauge it. But you're right. There are some things that increase. There are some things that decrease. The truth is your spending changes. And with inflation, you know, we have to think seriously about inflation and how that's going to factor into things. You know, that hasn't really been a huge consideration for a long time because inflation has been fairly low. You know, it's been around 2% or so. So we haven't really had to think too critically about that. But now we're starting to have to think more critically about that. And if inflation is going to be higher in the future, maybe we're going to need more. And that's one of the things that I do with clients in practice is try to do some of those calculations. Um, I walk through in the book how to uh, do some of those calculations yourself in a simple way. Uh, but there are a lot of nuances and it can be very tricky. So I want to, we're getting close to the end, but I do want to ask you about this because I'm trying to figure this out myself. I think I've made my decision. Social security, you know, my understanding is, and you probably know this better than I do. If you wait till you get to 70, then if you keep working, they will not tax it. But if you, and you'll get a lot more versus just trying to take it at 62 or 66 and i guess it keeps going up as you get as time goes on i think it's like for me it's like 66 and two-thirds or I, I don't know but i'm not planning on taking it then because yeah i'm willing to take the risk that i'm lucky enough to live past you know 80 because it's all just but i don't know if there's some way to figure out what is the best for you of whether or not you want to start taking social security or not. I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. Generally, I usually recommend people wait if they can, but it does depend on a lot of factors. Uh, if you're retiring, you know, let's say you're retiring at 62. If you're going to wait till 70 to take social security, you have a lot more strain on your portfolio because you have to pull more money out uh, for your spending until you get to that social security age. That may or may not be best. Or if you're going to retire at 70, you know, you would think maybe I generally should wait. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that tie into it. We use um, a pretty sophisticated software to model that for folks and to kind of figure out what's best for you individually, because it really does depend on a lot of factors. Uh, when you want to retire, what your spending is like, uh, and those sorts of things. You know, each year that you delay, your social security benefit goes up by 8%. And that's a pretty nice uh, increase, you know? So 
generally, uh, and that's a guaranteed increase. <laughs> so I usually uh, counsel people to wait if they can, but there are some circumstances where maybe it makes sense to go early. Maybe it makes sense for one, you know, in a couple for one spouse to take it and the other spouse to delay. And so we can try to figure out some of those nuances. If you're willing to take some risk, maybe you want to take social security early, but not spend it and invest it. You know, that actually can create a greater outcome, but you have to understand that there's some risk involved there. You know, uh, you're not going to be investing it for very long until you get to that, you know, other, that age 70 and, you know, stock market returns aren't something you can necessarily depend on uh, specifically over a short period of time. So there's some, some extra risk to think about in there. So if people, our listeners, our viewers, uh, if they want to get in contact with you or they want to, we said how to buy the book at ABA or whatever, but if they want to contact you, what's the best way to get up with you, Darren? Yeah, uh, you can just head on over to thelawyermillionaire.com. They'll take you to our website. And if you scroll to the bottom of the web page there, you'll see a link to my calendar and you can schedule a call with me. It could be a quick call or or a long call, you know, whatever works for you. If you have just a quick question or you want to dive into some more detail. Uh, but yeah, thelawyermillionaire.com. You can just head on over there and uh, you can schedule a meeting with me or send me an email or whatever you like. Yeah. And you know, they, you know, my nickname is the millionaire maker, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Awesome. Awesome. I love that. I just, I just thought about that as we were getting ready to, to sign off. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, Look forward to uh, meeting you in person one day. Really, do. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ken. I really appreciate it. You have been listening to the Grow Your Law Firm podcast, the podcast that leads lawyers to more growth, profit, and freedom. Go to growyourlawfirm.com to find more ways to market and manage your law firm. Please leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts.